Good morning, everybody. I'm here to tell you a little bit about the Wilderness Center, the Steger Wilderness Center, which is located up in Ely, Minnesota. And Will would be here himself today, but he just returned from uh, a four-week expedition um, when he was uh, north of the Quetico, and he's still in Ely and just kind of worn out. But if you want to read about his most current expedition, uh, you can go to our site, which is the SteegerWildernessCenter.com. And really the focus of the Center for Will over these years has really been to be a place where the understandings and skills and sort of the ethos of exploration uh, can really be uh, brought to bear on the problems uh, that we're all facing today. And so he began designing it uh, many years ago and it's been built by the hands of many craftsmen that are actually working alongside apprentices that come from colleges and high schools. And so it's kind of a remarkable story of that sort of mastery of skills, being close to the land, being uh, very connected to the wilderness and having faith in the power of the wilderness to really transform lives. Uh, it has several components to it. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that, but I thought it'd be best to show you a little video of the place so you can get a sense uh, of what it is that we're trying to accomplish there. So I'm gonna go ahead, I think, and this is of course the, the major building there that was designed and built by him, and we'll listen a little bit uh, about it. To the romantic, the Will Steger Wilderness Center seems a fairyland. Deep in the north woods of Minnesota, five miles from the nearest grid, sitting at the edge of the fabled Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. Up close to the realist, you see it's a building made of wilderness, of raw materials hewn from granite and wood. It was born in the mind of explorer and educator Will Steger, inside a tent, as he paused on the crossing of the Antarctic continent by dog sled. It rises from the lakes and the forest and from the mind of the only living explorer to be presented the National Geographic's John Oliver Lagorce Medal. Awarded only 19 times, Steger joins Amelia Earhart, Admiral Robert Perry, Roald Amundsen, and Jacques Cousteau in this honor. Steger has devoted himself to discovery in order to learn and to share what he has seen. And what Will has seen has disturbed him. The planet is in peril, and there has been little done to confront the dangers. So it was Will Steger's dream to create a sanctuary in nature where leaders from the United States and around the world could retreat, bask in nature's beauty, and be soothed by stillness. And in that stillness, loose the bonds of calcified thought, politics, and argument. Breathe deeply of fresh air and new ideas. Do what can only be done in such a setting. Learn to survive. There are no arguments around a campfire and it is Will's dream to make the Wilderness Center a figurative campfire around which gather the brightest minds in government, industry, environment, and the public to see a way forward, to find a path out of the peril we face by finding our way to the Wilderness Center. It has been said that in order to realize your dream, you must do something toward it every day. Will Steger, stone by stone, beam by beam, expedition by expedition, has been building this center of thought and solution for nearly 20 years. Enlisting the strong backs of the young and the ancient craftsmanship of the old masters and embracing the newest of technologies, the Steger Wilderness Center has sprung from the mind of one man, but the dream has been touched by a thousand hands. The Wilderness Center is not simply off-grid, a place in the woods. Using Will's aptitude for collaboration, he is joined with Cummins Power Generation, the University of St. Thomas, and Sundial Solar in creating Minnesota's first microgrid. It is fitting that Will's dream will be powered by nature. He is an optimist about our future. Optimism is contagious. The Steger Wilderness Center is not simply an idea whose time has come. It is an idea as old as humanity itself. All progress is rooted in innovation, courageousness, and sometimes disruptive ideas applied to the present moment. Progress becomes reality when great minds, young and old and seemingly opposing forces, join in collaboration to do as Emerson said, to not simply follow the path through the wilderness, 
but to make an entirely new path. So I hope that gives you a little flavor of what the place is like. I will just say um, one more minute of clarifying that there are three things that he really is committed to and one of them is really the power of the team. And so the whole operation is run by a team. I'm one of the leads on the team and there are a number of volunteers. And uh, what we plan every year is the whole program around the actual apprenticeships. This year we have a group of inner city kids coming up to work specifically on finishing some of the masonry work and we'll be working with stone folks. Uh, there's also the demonstration work, which was mentioned around the microgrid, which is very fitting to today's uh, conversation. I look forward to hearing more about that. And then, um, you know, kind of underneath the whole thing is the idea of leadership. And so again, connecting that expedition thinking in the mind of the explorer with leaders that can come up, take time, and actually begin to reflect together around some innovations uh, around some of the problems that we are all facing. So those are the three kind of components um, and I'm really happy to be here today to answer any questions. If you want to learn more you can go to the speakerwildernesscenter.com where you can also see uh, his reflections and podcasts from his most recent expedition. So thanks. Thanks for inviting me this morning. Thanks, Julie. We're glad you're here. I had the chance to meet Will a couple years back, and that, that optimist piece has stuck with me. It's nice to talk with someone who has some ideas and is also optimistic about where we're going. So thanks for being here. My name is Chris Blissett, and I'm the Executive Vice President at Nuger Communications Group, and it's my privilege to introduce our two speakers for today, both of whom have impressive backgrounds and both of whom offer really unique insights into energy use, energy innovations, and sustainability. I'm going to introduce them in reverse order. They're going back to back, so I'm going to start with our second speaker. Christopher Clark is the president of Northern States Power. Previously, Chris was the regional vice president of rates and regulatory affairs, and he spent a good chunk of his career in the regulatory world. In fact, he has more than 20 years of experience in energy and regulation. Chris and I chatted a little bit last week, and the notion of being an energy leader came up. And what he said to me then was this. Part of being a leader is to take a good look at the details and then make sure it fits together with the vision. We have to make sure it all fits together. We need to clarify the vision and then outline the transition. Two other quick things you should know about Chris. One, he's an Iowa native and he asks that you not hold that against him. And second, he's a huge and unabashed Rush fan. So if there are any other Rush fans out here, you can talk with them a little bit about that afterwards. So Chris is our second speaker today, but first up is Jim Ivester. Jim is Vice President of Facility Administration for the Minnesota Wild and General Manager of the St. Paul River Center, which includes the legendary Roy Wilkins Auditorium. And if Jim looks a little tired this morning, if you watched the game last night, you'll forgive him. Jim has spearheaded the effort to transform operations, including technology and energy use, across these massive entities. Today, they're award-winning, internationally recognized models of sustainability. I talked with Jim about 10 days or so, ago or so, and he mentioned a couple things that stuck with me. The first is that he told a great story about how Garrison Keillor essentially got him fired. Um, <laughs> you, can get, you can get that story from him after the fact. That's, that was a good one. But secondly, the thing that really stuck with me was this. I, he said, as we were talking about progress, he said, we've done some great things. And then he paused and he said, but we're not done yet. Chris and Jim, thank you both for being here. We're excited that you're here. We're excited to hear from you. Jim, you're up. Let me move to our introduction. And Minnesota's main feed on their top power play unit was to put Granlin out there. On the field, now the only right-handed shot on the Minnesota power play. It starts with a goal and the type of determination usually reserved for athletes to perform at the top of your game and to set a new standard for what being at the top can mean. 
If you consider the impact that we have relative to energy use, water use, transportation, and total waste that happens in our campus, that's a major impact in our environment. The Minnesota Wilds Facility Management Company manages the XL Energy Center, the St. Paul River Center, which includes the Roy Wilkins Auditorium, and roughly three million people come through these doors each year. Five years ago today, we, we began a journey to be a sustainable leader in the region. We were doing some recycling, but we knew it wasn't enough. We knew we needed to do more. Jim Ibister had a vision for a sustainable operation. The timing was absolutely perfect for the team to pull together as the green movement was gaining momentum. Event and meeting planners were looking for better, more sustainable options. The goals the team set were based on the recognition that our collective impacts on the environment simply can't be ignored. Climate change can uniquely affect the land of 10,000 lakes and the quality of life for future generations. So we need to shift the way we work, live, and play in ways that are practical and possible. Work with the environment is fundamentally good. It gives you a way to be an even stronger part of the community. It's good for the environment, it's good for the community, and it happens to be good business, but in all of the cases, I don't think that's the primary motivation. When I came into office, one of my primary goals was to make St. Paul one of the leaders on sustainability. All of these things fit into our broader goals of making St. Paul one of the most sustainable cities in the country. To craft a plan, we needed to understand the complete picture. We quickly realized that trash reduction was our biggest opportunity, but with three million visitors in this campus, that's a lot of trash. The year one goal was to completely redo the way we thought as a department. It was more than just putting out recycling containers. It was teaching staff who had been here for 25 years new ways of doing things, as well as new processes to how we collect trash and recycling. We needed to make it easy for staff, so we created a color-coded sorting system. Year two was really focused on changing our purchasing decisions for items that ended up in the waste stream. Everyone really needed to have a seat at the table. Operations staff, catering staff, security, event management, electricians, engineers. It really was a team effort. The transformation was nothing short of remarkable. In just the first year, the recycling rate jumped from 15% to over 40%, and trash was cut by half. The River Center parking ramp presented a great opportunity to showcase both energy efficiency by making the lights more energy efficient, but also renewable energy technologies. We were able to do energy efficient lighting improvements at the parking ramp, install a large photovoltaic system, and electric car charging stations. To date, we've upgraded about 1,500 lights throughout the campus. LED, fluorescent, taking HID out of the picture. It saved us $100,000 a year and we've gotten about $200,000 of rebates to that. Our biggest challenge was introducing compost. Composting is not that widespread in Minnesota. To get our staff to embrace that and then to teach that to our guests who come here has been very rewarding for us. All of this serveware is now compostable, which means it doesn't end up in a landfill. This showcases to millions of people each year that come into the River Center about what they can be doing in their businesses and in their homes. They see the recycling bins. They might look up on the roof and see the solar array. So it starts to shift in their consciousness what, what they could possibly do, whether it's on, uh, on a business level or even at their home. More than just the name on the arena, XL Energy partnered with the team to offset energy use for events by supplying credits through XL Energy's Wind Source program. The complex is now among the top five purchasers of wind power in Minnesota. This team was also ahead of the curve by being early participants in NHL's league-wide sustainability program, NHL Green. But 2014 will be remembered as the year the River Center and XL Energy Center team pulled off their very own hat trick by earning the complex three world-class certifications, LEED certification, Green Globe certification, and Apex ASTM certification. There is a saying that the greenest building you can build is the one you don't. That's what these three awards right here represent. Doing really good work transforming pre-existing buildings. In order to be in the position to achieve these awards, it's really about the leadership. We're fortunate that we have those people. 
Without their leadership, these awards would not have happened. Success breeds success. It resonates throughout the entire St. Paul community and, and far beyond. And the end game to this work was not about awards or certification. We're working to achieve goals that will have a significant impact on the community, the city that we love, and our families. That's just a little bit of our story, a beginning story, about uh, what we were trying to achieve starting about 2009. You know, we are, uh, we are not energy experts. We uh, put together a team that was interested in doing something uh, bigger and uh, uh, more important than our, our uh, sometimes our hockey games or our concerts. And uh, we're a real passionate team, a real passionate uh, set of employees who really wanted to uh, make a difference. The uh, certifications were really important and I'm just going to fly through a couple of these things because we've already talked about them or you've seen a little bit of them in the video. But um, it's interesting when we talk about these three uh, certifications um, because they all mean a little bit different to, to uh, the organization. First of all, the, the LEED certification is really about meeting standards and doing the things that you need to do to, to sort of prove what you've done. Uh, Green Globes is really operational. It's about what have we done every day to make a difference in our operations. And um, Apex ASTM, which is the GMIC logo that you see there, um, is a really important one for us because what that essentially does is says that people who come into our facility um, can host a green event, can host a sustainable event in our facility because our facility is certified to do so. And that was really important for us because it really talked about inclusion and involving a lot of people uh, uh, in a bigger, broader way. It was about leadership and sustainability, which was really what we were, what we were trying to do. Our main mission as an organization is to create a greater state of hockey. That's not just about hockey. That's about a better place for all of us to live in. And so we had to look across the organization and across our operation to find ways that we could do that. It was important because not only does it help us uh, do a, a, you know, great things for the environment, but it actually is great business. It really does help us uh, operate a more efficient organization. Waste was our first program. We had a goal really early on. 50-50 uh, and 2 was our goal is to reduce our trash by 50%, increase our recycling rating rate to 50% in two years. We smashed that in about 18 months. Um, we're currently at about 65% in our recycling rate. Um, uh, 300 tons of organics a year, a program that was uh, really pioneered um, in the convention industry. Water, really tremendous story in water, just as you know, think about how important water is in our organization, and uh, especially for ice, uh, something we should really think about. <laughs> And, uh, uh, you know, we, went, we spent uh, probably a little bit more than $500, changed a few thousand aerators in our organization and, uh, you know, saved 78,000 gallons of water in one year by a very small uh, change. And that's what this was all about, making incremental changes to uh, make a big impact. But we're here to talk a little bit more about energy and, you know, it's interesting because energy, we think a lot about in the early days moving to compact fluorescent. And that was our, the big move into energy, especially in our facilities. And we knew that we had to do a lot more than that. First of all, we wanted to make sure that our building was operating efficient, efficiently. And there's a lot to do as it relates to that. Our goal was to be 20% more efficient than average. We are currently exceeding 25% more efficient uh, than average. Of course, we did. The easiest way to achieve energy savings is to 
change your practices. Uh, we upgraded 1,500 lights, as we said in the video. We're still doing it. Our big process right now is actually all the sport lights that are out there in the arena. They're there, you know, essentially to light a big TV show. You know, that's what a hockey game is, a big giant TV show. Um, we're in the process of this summer switching all of those over to LED. It's a really interesting process because not only are you just trying to get a light level, but you have to meet a lot of different requirements as it relates to what broadcasters want. So it's a very interesting process about you know, what is the color temperature and, and wh you know, where do shadows happen and how can you make that work to be most efficient. But the energy savings will be really, really quite remarkable when that is all done. So uh, this is essentially the, uh, the uh, overall building footprint uh, from the, uh, the campus. And uh, you can see down there, the, uh, the little star down there is our parking ramp, which is right across the building. Uh, buildings from us, this is built in 1970. Um, back when the old uh, Civic Center was built. And if you've been to that parking ramp, it, you know, you probably could tell that it was built in 1970 or so. <laughs> um, but uh, one of the things we did was, uh, one of the first things we did was switch all of those lights out to, uh, to fluorescent. And uh, amazingly, uh, that saved, you know, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 in the very, very first year. Quite a remarkable project. It was also important to tell our story. And one of the ways we tell our story is by being very public about our practices. So um, we also included uh, car charging stations um, at the top of the ramp as well. Uh, car charging stations really was a, a, a way in which we said, hey, we're serious about our concern about the environment. But it was also a real public way to help tell our story, to, to let people know that we were engaged in this process. And then in the River Center itself, there were many things to do. One of the things that we did across our loading areas was increase, uh, or was to add these uh, high-speed doors instead of the low, slow-moving, uh, big, heavy electronic uh, uh, steel doors. We moved to high-speed doors, which um, from the outside to the inside, obviously, when all the exhibits and things like that are moving into the convention center, helps to keep that energy and that heat or that cooling in. And then in our conference room, uh, one of our main boardrooms, we partnered up with Sage Electronic. Sage Electronics in Faribault, Minnesota, and installed uh, brand new windows of, uh, that were automatically adjust. You can see the top levels are, are set to uh, be forced adjust to be dark. The bottoms will also do that. You can also set them to automatic so that in the summer, um, they'll automatically tint and keep the, the heat load off. In the winter, they get a little bit more clear and bring some of that heat load back in. It's a great way to help offset a, a room that's full of windows and a space that can really be affected by, by that type of uh, process. Big projects, though, were really important to us, and solar thermal was one of them. A uh, uh, partnership with uh, Solar Cities and um, the AARA uh, and uh, District Energy um, allowed us to put two large solar arrays on top of the St. Paul River Center. These are solar thermal. And uh, the solar thermal is a little bit different than that photovoltaic that you saw in the video as it related to the parking ramp. This essentially heats hot water. The hot water then heats, uh, helps heat our building, but also helps our, heat our domestic hot water that uh, we use in, in uh, just like you would see in a normal hot water heater. And Whenever we ex we're done with whatever we need within that hot water system, that hot water actually ends up going back into the system, heats other uh, neighboring district energy uh, heated uh, buildings. So uh, a great process. Now this is a, a situation where this isn't a huge money saving uh, item for the facility. This is, a, this is a smart technology that makes sense. Why wouldn't you do that if that's uh, if that's how you can heat your water in the building and you can do it by solar, why wouldn't you do it that way? Um, but it was a great project and a great partnership with uh, District Energy uh, in St. Paul. Of course, as we talked about, the uh, solar uh, PV or the photovoltaic uh, 81 kilowatt solar electric system on the vertical wall of the uh, parking ramp uh, across the street. We, um, we don't have a lot of surface area. We have sort of domed roofs in our spaces that uh, are part of our auditorium spaces. And we don't have a lot of flat surface area. But we had a big wall facing the south. And so we, uh, on that, that side of the uh, parking ramp, we added a very large 
a photovoltaic uh, solar array, again with solar uh, uh, partnership with uh, Solar Cities America, and this time, of course, with XL Energy. XL Energy has been a huge partner uh, of ours, not only in the process of um, helping us do big projects like this, but really helping us work through a plan. Uh, that was the key, is what is the plan? We can't do all these things in one fell swoop. We were very incremental. And in order to do that, you really had to have a great plan. One of the most exciting things that we did, however, was to be involved in the wind source program. And I say exciting, if you go back to the whole idea of we talked about getting our uh, people, our events certified when they come in, having them be a certified event, WindSource is a great example of how they can participate in that. Um, we uh, were a WindSource uh, uh, user for a long time. We then got involved in, a, I think, a very innovative program, which is WindSource for Events, which allowed, uh, first of all, us, ourselves, we did it for all of our WoW games throughout the whole season, plus the playoffs, which will be a long run. I guarantee a long run. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say earlier that the, uh, uh, perhaps the performance last night was a little bit my fault. I, I was praying for no overtime, and <laughs> I took it a little bit too far, I think, on that one. But that's all right. You've got to let those things go. You go move on to the next day. But our entire season was uh, 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 powered by WindSource. Uh, we have many, many events that have also now uh, are powered by uh, the WindSource program, and it's their choice. It's a small, small upcharge to their facility, but they're making that choice because it's important to them. Uh, we have a, uh, a roller derby bout in Roy Wilkins Auditorium this Saturday uh, for the Minnesota Roller Girls, and they're, uh, they're, uh, I think they're against uh, Chicago. Windy City, they decided to use WindSource for that particular event, so that was great. It's, a, it's an exciting time to be a part of a team. We just heard how important teams are. Um, we, are, we use the team analogy quite often, obviously, in our facility um, because it works. Um, and everybody playing their specific role was really important. We're not energy experts, but we know that there are many, many people who are, and that bringing them in not only makes us a better and more uh, sustainable organization, but also makes us much more smart. I'll leave it with one more way that that happens. We partnered with an organization called OSI, and we meter all of our electrical needs throughout the entire facility. Why do we do that? Well, when we first started our sustainability efforts, it was about benchmarking. You know, where are we, or where, where, do, you know, where, have we, where are we coming from? And we also, as we moved incremental changes, we wanted to know, you know, how are we doing? And so we meter everything electronically, all of our electric, all our district, all of our water. And, uh, it goes up there, obviously, into the magic cloud, and then it gets pulled down uh, by a company called OSI. It allows us to see a dashboard of that energy every single day. Um, it allows us to check on anomalies. You know, when you're in the event industry, weird things can happen. Uh, I remember one day we were looking through, it was the middle of the summer, and we were looking through the uh, event uh, energy reports, and we saw this large heat spike, um, 7 o'clock in the morning on a Friday, I believe. What is that? You know, what, what, how can that be? It's, it's 90 degrees out. And uh, so we were working through the operation trying to figure that out. It was really interesting. We were down talking to the person who makes the ice. He said, I know exactly what that is. And we said, oh, really? Well, let us know. That would be important for us to find out why this is, this is happening. And he said, well, we're getting ready for training camp. And when we make ice, we make ice. The water that goes in the Zamboni is hot water. And in order to get hot water, it's through our district loop that we talked about. So they had actually charged that whole loop of hot water in order to get hot water to go to the Zamboni, which when they charged that loop of hot water, it made a hot water spike. It said, ha, ah, OK, well, those little small uses of hot water, we might want to find a new way to heat that water rather than charging the entire pipes of all the hot water loop in that area. And so that was really insightful. And then it started, we started to learn some other things like, hey, you know, we can transfer this over to our ice. And so we have actually a screen down by our ice level, uh, right where the Zamboni drives in. And it allows us to understand the environmental temperatures around that rink, the slab temperature, the ice temperature, um, the temperature at the bench, uh, the temperature up in the bowl area. And the reason for that is we're collecting data, and we're very, very close to sort of finalizing this last little bit. We're collecting data to understand when the ice goes bad. Because our previous way to be able to tell that 
is when a, a player or an official came off and said it's chippy or it's mushy or it's uh, really snowy. Well, by that time, it's too late. You know, we're already an hour into the game. We're not going to make another, you know, an impact within that last hour. By the time we do something, the game will be over. So our idea is, is that what we really want to do is understand that before you can even perceive it on the ice, is to understand what are the trends. When the ice is bad, let's go back, start overlaying those pictures of bad ice days, and see what happens uh, early on, and maybe we can reverse that trend. That all came out of our efforts in sustainability. Our operation became that much better. So a really exciting uh, program for us, something that really rallies the staff together, and something that we think is ultimately good for business and uh, good for our community. So thank you. Well, that was a fascinating uh, discussion, uh, and it's amazing what you can do. I, uh, like most, I'm simply a fan when I go to the Excel Energy Center, which I look forward to doing on May 12th to see a great concert, <laughs> which I hope is powered by Windsource. I'll go do some checking on that when I get back. I don't have a video, um, but it is great to be here. Thanks very much for the invitation. Congratulations on your acquisition. That's a wonderful business change. It sounds like you have some great new colleagues. Uh, what a uh, great uh, to follow you and hear about all the wonderful things you've done at Excel Energy Center and how you can uh, use the, the great conservation programs we have. And of course, exciting to be uh, with the Steger uh, Foundation after uh, Earth Day. So I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, what we have going on at Excel Energy and try to tie into the topic of renewable energy. So I'll just give you a quick overview of who we are as a company, uh, what's changing in our industry, uh, and then I want to talk about our uh, upcoming or our filed resource plan, which is really where we make decisions for what our energy is going to look like for the next 15 years. Um, this is just an overview of our entire company. <coughs> Excel Energy Inc. is a holding company made up of four operating utilities. And just some information about those. We do have a national presence, but we're headquartered here in Minneapolis. Uh, we provide gas, electric transmission and dis distribution uh, generation. We have just about every type of generation you can think of, from nuclear plants, coal plants, to wind, solar, biomass, hydro, uh, plus we buy a lot on the market, and of course, uh, great conservation programs. So this is our Minnesota company. We're the largest uh, utility in Minnesota. Uh, we're also the largest uh, utility company in North Dakota, and it doesn't really look like it there, uh, but we serve Fargo. Uh, we serve Minot, uh, so by customers, by amount of energy used, we actually are a, a big player in North Dakota. We also serve in South Dakota. Um, other operating companies serve different parts of the country, uh, country including uh, we have uh, Eau Claire, Wisconsin, up into the UP of uh, Michigan nearby. Well, let me just talk to you about some things that are going on in the uh, industry. Well, that didn't work right. There are... <laughs> I got a problem with my slides, but we'll just uh, ignore that. First, let me just say there are some uh, changing economics in the uh, industry. So all this great conservation means that uh, our sales are flat. Now, most businesses try to increase their sales so they can gain more revenue. Uh, we're in a different business. I actually want you all to go home and put in LED light bulbs so I can sell you less electricity. <laughs> and most of you will think that doesn't make sense, but I actually just did it yesterday for Earth Day. I thought I'm going to put a bunch of LED light bulbs in. Great light quality, it cuts your lighting uh, load incredibly. Um, so these changing economics are really, uh, mean that we have to be very thoughtful about how we do our business. Um, we also have uh, a lot of growing customer expectations with our customers really uh, wanting to do more with energy. A lot of customers care about how they use their energy. They want to be greener and so we try to provide those things. And then finally, uh, it's not just li limited to our customers and our sales. Uh, there are folks in Washington and in St. Paul and in other places where we're governed uh, that have a, a vision of, of trying to actually transform the energy landscape. We have the national debate over carbon reduction. Uh, the EPA has moved forward with a rule called 111D that's going to try to achieve 30% carbon reduction by 2030. 
In Minnesota, that goal is not nearly good enough for us. We have an 80 percent by 50 goal, and the Minnesota Commission has really pushed us to make real progress on it. So I mentioned our sales are flat with residential customers. We're actually starting to see residential customers uh, use less and less energy each year. This is something we've seen on the natural gas side. We're now starting to see it move to the energy side. A lot of our small businesses as well, we're seeing a declining usage profile. Uh, the only places where we're really seeing growth is when we grow as an economy and add uh, new businesses to our system or we have an existing large industrial business that expands. So that kind of growth is actually a good kind of growth because it's typically associated with adding jobs, uh, adding uh, more revenue to our state through taxes, um, and uh, is, it shows that we have a growing economy. Uh, the good thing is we have programs that we target to all different sizes of customers so we can really uh, try to uh, make sure that we have efficient growth when we have growth. Well, for a business that's uh, experiencing declining sales, um, we have another challenge, and that's that a lot of our system was put in in the 50s and 60s when the Twin Cities were really growing, uh, the suburbs were growing. Uh, those poles and wires are getting old, and so uh, we have things that are 50, 60, 70 years old that need to be replaced. Very capital intensive work. Uh, we've been spending about a billion dollars a year uh, upgrading our systems. Uh, and then, of course, with flat sales, that means I'm over uh, seeing the Minnesota Commission about raising rates, which is really a popular thing to do. <laughs> but it's part of the mix. Another thing that we've seen that's really exciting is that we've seen renewable pricing uh, start to really uh, change dramatically. Wind, uh, which does have a benefit of a production tax credit, uh, has become substantially more competitive. The industry has really learned uh, how to bring the costs down. The production tax credit is expiring, but we're still seeing wind pricing that is able to compete with natural gas. So natural gas and wind kind of go back and forth on uh, when you're looking at the market. The fracking and uh, uh, um, boom that we've seen has really meant that we've seen extraordinarily cheap natural gas prices. Uh, I think as we uh, start to see some export of natural gas, we'll actually see a little bit of upward pressure on natural gas prices and renewables will continue to be in the mix. Well, solar, everybody is excited about the potential of solar. and on utility scale projects, which are really the larger ones out in a rural area where uh, you take over an entire field with a large project, those projects we're seeing in the next 15 years are actually going to start competing with natural gas as well. Um, but another exciting part of solar is uh, what we saw at the Excel Energy Center parking ramp is that you can actually have it be part of the community. That solar we're not seeing as competitively priced as the large scale. Uh, but we are seeing more and more integration of that type of solar into the, uh, into the system, a lot more dis what we call distributed energy generation. So it really provides a lot of opportunity to talk about how we're going to have a changing in energy um, system. Beyond that, there is all sorts of excitement about new technologies. Uh, microgrids, uh, these are uh, interesting both from having a piece of the grid that can stay operating even if um, other parts of the grid experience an interruption. So take something like the Excel Energy Center. They don't want to have an interruption during a hockey game or an important rush concert. So <laughs> we will uh, uh, be able to explore whether having them be able to pull off the grid and keep running with a local source of generation uh, actually makes sense. We have some large industrial customers who are very sensitive to having interruptions as well. Uh, so there's that potential. And then we have things like residential neighborhoods or university campuses where people are interested in knowing if they can actually have community source generation uh, and that, have that be part of a microgrid. And then the, the sort of the final frontier on new technologies, at least for today, is batteries with a lot of excitement about whether batteries can really start changing uh, how we look at things. Right now, the solar energy peaks in the mid-afternoon, you can think of the sort of the warmest part of the day. But our peak energy usage, what we experience is when customers go home after work and start turning on all their appliances, they turn their air conditioning down if they want to cool the house down in the summer or turn the uh, furnace up. And so that creates a load for us. So those two curves don't match right now. Batteries might be able to bring those closer together. Now this technology, we would have told you two years ago, was 15 to 20 years away. 
This year, we're actually looking at it in the five to 10 year horizon. Next year, it might be on our doorstep. A lot of change, a lot of money being spent trying to figure out what, what's uh, possible. So it's really pretty excitement. And then I already mentioned the EPA and the state goals for sustainability. Customers want more. Uh, we have the Clean Energy Partnership in Minneapolis. Uh, a lot of uh, corporate customers have sustainability goals. Lots of interest in that. And then, of course, customers who budget would like to have predictability. And so we've really been trying to work to be able to give people a, a three to five year view of here's what your rates look like. You can bring that down with conservation. We might have some things float around the edges of it, but really to give people a better idea of what's coming. So in the past, we thought of uh, energy generation as a large central station power plant through big, large transmission lines through distribution to homes and businesses. Uh, and we called that the grid that moved power from us to you. Uh, what we're seeing now is a lot of competition, but that grid is really important to uh, embracing all sorts of new things uh, that we can do. Well, let me switch and talk about the resource plan. We file a resource plan with the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission that outlines what do we need to do in the next five years for our system and where do we want to be in the next 15 years? And finally, how do we think we're actually making real progress to an 80% carbon reduction by 2050? So we take on a lot. We filed that plan, our current one, in January of this year. Uh, <clears throat> we are uh, predicting that we will have 30% of our energy generation from renewables by 2030. Uh, we're also predicting in that plan that we'll have the opportunity to watch pricing and if we see basically bargains, if we see good priced renewable energy, we can, we can increase that more. Uh, we're also proposing to achieve 40% carbon reduction by 2030. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier the EPA goal is 30% by 30. Um, we're actually trying to, to do more. Uh, we think we have the opportunity to do it cost effectively. Uh, and so we've set a target of 40% by 30, which we think we can pretty easily hit. Uh, and finally, we're going to have a, a good diverse mix of resources, which we think is important to keeping the overall price uh, component of your rates uh, as reasonable as we can. You can see we have renewables, uh, nuclear, which is carbon free. It's an important part of uh, how we're able to achieve that carbon reduction in the near term. We continue to have coal, but our coal is actually starting to ramp down over the period. And as part of the resource plan, we're actively looking at um, scenarios that would take that faster. Um, and I think there's obviously a lot of interest in that. But part of what we're trying to be careful about is that we don't become too heavy in natural gas. A lot of other utilities don't have the diversity that we have on our system. And that means they're going to go put all of their eggs in the natural gas basket. And as long as fracking continues and natural gas prices are cheap, I guess they're OK. But they're betting on a commodity market. And I don't want to do that for our customers. I want to keep the diversity. I still think that by doing that, we can have our mix be 63% carbon free, uh, uh, a mix of energy, which uh, is nation leading as you'd, as you'd expect. And that's how we would like to be. But I'm also focused on trying to keep the cost reasonable. So we can look at doing things more. We can look at doing things faster. But as part of that, we really need to keep our eye on what we're doing to the, the customer bill, because that's part of keeping us competitive as a region. So there's our preferred plan. Um, just move through and show you. We'll have uh, significant amounts of wind, carbon reduction, going to add a lot of solar. We actually think we'll hit the 10%. Uh, Minnesota has various goals for renewable resources. We're way ahead of our uh, wind energy goals, a renewable energy standard. There's a 10% solar, which was sort of put out as a lot of we'll, we'll put it out here. We don't think you can reach it, but we'll see what you can do. Again, a couple of years ago, we would have said won't be cost effective. We now think we'll have 8% solar by 30. We'll hit the 10% with the renewable energy credits which is a, we don't need to get into, but just shows that it's part of how we measure how we're making the progress. We continue to have our coal units, but back down those operations, using them less, uh, and continue to have a, a diverse energy mix. This just gives you a, a, a snapshot of what our portfolio looked like before and what it looked like looks like after. You can see wind is up at 25%. Um, that's actually, uh, 
having this much renewables on the system. And of course, wind that moves around as the wind blows, uh, that means we got to do a lot of other things in our system to keep it balanced because people don't like their lights going up and down like that. So, uh, but we're actually getting better and better at it. We actually try to forecast the wind. Uh, we have uh, been, again, nation leading on really integrating these renewables into our system. And I, I want, and we have the opportunity to keep doing that here in Minnesota. And you can see coal starts ramping down from 37% down to 29%, and nuclear stays part of the mix. Uh, again, another big question coming for us uh, is where nuclear goes, but I won't get into that right now. Um, carbon reductions, uh, we're actually on target to be at 31% by 2020, ahead of where the EPA would like us to be by 2030. Um, these are good things. Uh, we're actually working to get more credit with the EPA under their new rule for what we've already done here in Minnesota uh, as part of the national debate, uh, but we do like the certainty of having those targets out there. Um, and this just shows you uh, some different uh, oh, things. Uh, we'll double our wind power from what we have now to 2030. Uh, AWEA continuously names us the number one wind provider uh, in the nation. Uh, we offer our wind source programs. Solar, there are different kinds of solar. We have large scale utility sales solar uh, projects, uh, residential rooftop solar, and then community solar gardens, which is a new program uh, that we started in December. Uh, we have a similar program out in Colorado. This gives people the opportunity to participate in solar without having to put it on their roof. Uh, we think it's actually something that our customers are very excited about. As a new program, it is going through some bumps at the front end, and we'll work with the commission to get those sorted out. Uh, but I think it'll be part of a, an overall mix that just gives customers more options. Um, natural gas, as I said before, one of the things I really want to be careful about is that as we add natural gas to our system, we're not going too natural gas heavy. I think a lot of our competitors or other utilities out there are going to do that. I think they're going to be sorry when something spikes in the natural gas markets. Um, we actually have the opportunity to add renewable energy instead of adding natural gas, and it makes more sense to do that. Um, but it's like everything, uh, it gets complicated. There's a lot of policy debate around it. Uh, and then nuclear, we have three nuclear units which provide us nice, solid uh, carbon-free energy. Uh, we do have a waste storage issue with the national government that we go back and forth with. Uh, right now, these are an important part of our mix. They're going to operate, um, they're currently licensed to operate through the early 2030s. And then uh, we, uh, as a group, really need to decide what we want to do with nuclear in our mix uh, going forward. And I say we because uh, we come forward and make recommendations to the commission, but it's a very public process. We participate with stakeholders, we encourage dialogue. Uh, we know people care about what their mix is, and so we actually want to have uh, want to have that discussion. In parallel, the NRC is looking at what it takes to operate nuclear units for another 20 years. So um, out in the 2030s, our units will have operated for 60 years. The NRC is currently starting the process for what the rules would be to make sure that you can safely operate from 60 to 80 years or 60 to 70 years. So we'll also watch how that plays out and what costs are involved with that. Um, coal. Lots of attention on coal. Uh, what we've done in our plan is actually show a ramping down of our coal units. We actually think this is a flexible approach that lets us continue to displace the energy that we were getting from coal with renewable energy. I call it a dialing down versus a, uh, sometimes you hear about turning coal plants off. I, I view that as the light, light switch decision. What I try to be careful with there is uh, when you make that light switch decision to turn it off, you need to replace the capacity to serve our customers, and a lot of utilities are doing that by simply dropping in a gas plant. Uh, that's viable, and it is actually cost effective to do that, um, but you just have to be very conscious of how much gas you're adding to your system. Um, I also think we have the opportunity to maximize the investments and sort of play off which is the better to add the renewables or the gas as we move forward. Uh, there'll be a lot of debate about this in our resource plan over the course of this year. Uh, a lot of groups, um, both locally and nationally, have targeted coal plants trying to, to seek shutdowns. And so that'll actually be taken up uh, in our resource plan with our two oldest units, Sherco 1 and 2, uh, and will be a pretty active policy debate. 
Well, we like to brag, so here's uh, some of the things we do. Uh, number one wind provider, we're adding a significant amount of renewables. We're actually one of the companies who's built the most transmission. So these are the large power lines that you see. We've built a lot of transmission uh, to support the wind that we've added in southwest Minnesota and also to make the grid reliable for the next 25, 35, 45 years. So uh, we're really kind of moving through the peak of that investment, uh, but we've done it well. We're proud of that. We're achieving a lot in carbon reductions. And when the lights go out, we're actually one of the fastest utilities at getting them back on. And a lot of folks simply want the lights to go on when they turn the switch and don't want to think about it. And I'm happy with that too. Uh, but when the, the lights go out, we hear from them. So, um, and if you're running a business and the lights go out, you know, you're losing revenue. So we, we're actually very proud of our, uh, the reliability we've maintained in our system uh, and our focus on quick storm response. And I'll just tell you, we saw it from other utilities when we went out and helped after Hurricane Sandy, and not everybody spent the money and the time to do it right. So we're happy that we have. And that's my presentation. Hopefully I didn't go through too fast. I just wanted to give you some highlights of uh, what's active in our arena, uh, what we think about and how we think about it. It's a very public process that we have. Um, people uh, participate through interest groups, uh, but uh, individual businesses and customers are obviously welcome to share their views with us and uh, can participate in the process as well. So thanks very much for the opportunity.